This is the last lecture on pattern forming systems, and one of the things I want to highlight uh, is this idea of modal analysis and mode coupling. Many systems in the physics and, engin physics and engineering have spatial temporal structures where there's dominant modes. In other words, the underlying behavior comes from eigenfunctions that dominate the system. And one of the questions you could ask is, how do these eigenfunctions interact, especially due to nonlinearity or forcing? So this entire pattern forming uh, work we've been doing can be brought nicely over to do this modal analysis and mode coupling work to start to understand how the spatial temporal structures that you see can ultimately be driven by some of the underlying patterns and eigenfunctions that are in that system or the modes of that system and, and their interaction then determines much of the dynamics you would actually see in practice. So the idea here again is I'm going to consider some spatial temporal dynamical system and I U T L U L is going to be some linear operator. I'm putting here an I in front of this explicitly because this form here is exactly what you get in optics and quantum mechanics where you have oscillatory fields. And so I'm going to explicitly account for that by putting an IUT here because what I'm going to look for is the eigenfunction of this operator L, but I'm going to look for solutions that are sort of time periodic. I'm also going to force this system. So here it is, some generic forcing. And I'm going to try to understand how does the forcing affect some of the underlying patterns that happen in this system that are driven by dominant modal structures. Okay, so how are we going to solve this? Well, the simplest thing to start to look at is looking at the separation of variables argument. And here it is. Take your solution, your base solution, u naught, and that's where epsilon is 0. So it just solves this part of the equation, which is linear. So that's what we're going to also consider. Is we're going to consider this modal analysis is going to be the leading order solution is going to be linear. And so u naught is some linear solution, is solution to the linear problem where epsilon is 0. I'm going to break it up into a spatial part, v of x, and e to the i lambda t. So notice, I want lambdas to be, to be real, and so I want solutions that are oscillatory in time. So again, this is characteristics of electrodynamics and quantum mechanics, where in fact that's exactly the kind of solutions that you get, are time periodic solutions. So I'm going to put this into this equation up here with epsilon is 0, and what I get is the following eigenvalue problem, lv equals lambda v. So what I can do with that is start looking at its eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. And those are going to be the framing on which I'm going to build my solution types. Okay? So this decomposition leads me to the eigen, an eigenvalue problem, which is going to allow me an eigenfunction expansion solution. So remember that these eigen decompositions are really powerful because once you have these eigenfunctions, v of n, they form an orthonormal basis that I can use to represent any solution. And the lambda n are their associated eigenvalues. Now, both of these are going to play a really big role in helping us understand spatial temporal patterns that arise in systems because they're essentially going to be interactions among these eigenfunctions who have characteristic eigenvalues. Remember that these are orthonormal. So in fact, they're, so their inner product is 0 everywhere except when it's the function itself, then it's unity. Okay. So we have these nice properties of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. And the interesting thing about these is if it's a linear system and if all the energy or if all the action of the system is in a single eigenfunction, it would always stay there. The only way for eigenfunctions to interact is I either have to perturb the system or rely on nonlinearity to create interaction. And that's exactly what we're going to focus in on. We're going to come back to this problem here and say, my epsilon term is not just a forcing, but it could also be nonlinearity. I could drive the system. I could use nonlinearity to start coupling mode energy between these modes. And all we've been doing in this pattern forming work is starting to identify slow, and slow space and time scales for us to understand how the energy is being essentially shifted around in the system to, to produce patterns that are, in fact, manifest in what we observe in that system. All right, so here's the idea of what you do when you do an eigenfunction expansion. This goes back to earlier in the course, we talked a lot about eigenfunction expansion solutions, right? The solution u is some coefficient a of n 
the eigenfunctions times e to the i lambda nt. And lambda n is the eigenvalue. Remember, I did a separation of variable solution. It looked like this. And I found some, the lambdas were lambda n's and the v's were v of n's. So I'm just saying, hey, it's a sum of those because it's a linear problem. I can use linear superposition. And this is exactly what I've done here is written down an eigenfunction solution where notice that the eigenvalues tell you how things are evolving in time, right? So if lambda n is big, it means it's a very rapid rotation. If lambda n is small, it's a, it's a slow rotation of the field, okay? Slow frequency of the field. So this is my generic expansion, but of course, I'm going to perturb the system, and I also have to determine those a of n's. And so normally what I'd say is, well, I have some initial condition to the system. Here it is, u of x. And so how do I determine the a of n? Well, all I have to do is uh, basically put t equals 0 in here and use my orthogonality conditions to find that the a of n are just the inner product of u with respect to each of the eigenfunctions itself. Okay? So that gives me the a of n's. And so now I'm ready to expand. Uh, and I have everything determined, except here's what I'm going to do now. My expansion is going to look like this, but now what we've been doing with these pattern forming systems is introducing slow space and time scales. Here I'm just going to introduce slow space. And in particular, those A of n's now, I'm going to allow them to be dependent upon slow time. So the coefficient at leading order for each of these parameters, for each of the eigenfunctions is constant, but now I'm going to let it vary on some slow time tau, which is epsilon t. So that's what we're going to introduce into this modal expansion idea, is slow time evolution of the modal coefficients. OK. So let's do some perturbation theory to formalize this. And remember, everything I've been doing in this pattern forming like set of lectures is really just introducing slow space time scales, satisfying solvability conditions. That's it. That's the whole magic to it. And then by satisfying those, those by using the slow scales to satisfy the uh, Fredholm alternative theorem, you actually get a lot of insight into the problem you're trying to solve. So here, what we're going to do is perturb around some solution, u naught, and there's my perturbation, u tilde. And again, part of what I want to understand is how do modes couple in time due to different mechanisms? Because what I really want to understand in many of these systems that have underlying modal dynamics how is it that energy gets exchanged between modes? And it happens in a couple of characteristics way. One is through nonlinearity. Nonlinearity can actually cause these things to couple and shift energy amount among them. The other is forcing of the system and driving the coupling. So we're going to characterize that. So here we go. Take the solution, linearize. Here's my linearized evolution equations. So here's the leading order theory, which, by the way, this is where I can do my eigenfunction expansion at the leading order. And then you get that same thing on the left-hand side of the next order. But now, at next order, notice the right-hand side term has the slow evolution of your leading order solution plus whatever perturbation you might have brought into here, which could be due to a forcing or due to nonlinearity. Okay? And I want to understand the effect of these terms in driving the modal dynamics. So if there is no forcing, by the way, if f equals 0, then essentially what you're going to find is the slow evolution of all the parameters is 0. Nothing happens. So when you initially project and find the a of n by projecting onto the initial conditions, there's no perturbations to the system. This is telling you something important. Whatever energy is in a certain mode at a given time is the same for all time. Never changes. Okay. And so that means the system, if I load all the energy into a one particular eigenfunction, it will always remain in that eigenfunction, function, and all the other eigenfunctions will never, ever get any energy. Okay? But now, we're going to move to f not being 0 and ask the question, what do perturbations do to that picture? So there's a couple ways to create mode coupling, or from energy to be transferred among these modes of the system. The first is you can do mode coupling through forcing. So let's take a two-mode expansion here. So let's take this u of x t, and here's one mode, the nth mode, a of n, v of n, e to the i, l, m, n, t. 
and the nth mode, a of m, v of m, e to the i lambda, mt. And what I want to do with this, if I now have some perturbation f into the system, what solvability will require then is for the slow evolution is I will get this for the slow ampl amplitude equation evolution. I, dn, dan, d tau, in other words, the slow evolution of the a of nth component is given by the per I, uh, inner product of the perturbation with the v, with the v of nth eigenvector times e to i lambda mt. And same thing with i of m. In other words, you see that if I have a generic f, I will get an evolution for each one of these components. So that's an important uh, thing to understand. And by the way, more than that, if that f here is dependent on u0, where u0 is all those field expansions, then this u0 can, in fact, create mode coupling between different, so a of n can be coupled to a of m. So let's do this through forcing. In other words, let's go ahead and take the f being some v of x t times u. So now when you plug this form of forcing in to this right hand side here, in other words, this u naught both depends on a of n and a of m, I'm now going to cause a of n to couple to a of m, and I'm going to cause a of m to couple to a of n. So before, with no perturbation, once energy is in a mode, it stays there in the linear theory. But now with the forcing, the forcing perturbation itself causes coupling. And you can compute this, and here are your slow dynamics that happen. This is called mode coupling theory. And what it tells you is exactly how these two modes are actually interacting and exchanging energy due to some perturbation f that, for instance, that looks like this. So you have these coefficients there, alpha of nn, which is essentially its own interaction with itself. But this one's the more interesting one, alpha mn. By the way, that's the inner product of this v of x against u, v of n and v of m, against the two eigenfunctions. So v was 1. Of course, these are orthogonal. But v is not 1, and they're not going to be, this is not going to be 0. And then you have this term here, e to the i delta. In other words, the delta is the difference in the eigenvalues. So e to the i difference in eigenvalues t, e to the negative i difference in eigenvalues. And so what you have here is a generic way that energy from one mode starts shifting its energy, sending it to the other mode, and back and forth. That's what this tells you. This is the slow evolution dynamics. So this mode coupling theory through forcing is a standard in optical physics and quantum mechanics in which you actually have the underlying base state is really dominated by eigenfunction structures. But then if you perturb it, you can actually you can perturb it in such a way to dictate where you want to put your energy, on what eigenfunctions. And that's exactly what you want to do in manipulating optical waveguide couplers, as well as even in quantum mechanics, making systems jump from one energy, to a, uh, from one energy level to another. And you just manipulate that through forcing it and driving it. And these are the equations of evolution that tell you how this happens. This is very generic. Okay? It doesn't have to apply to quantum mechanics or optics. But you can just see that if I have a perturbation, the slow evolution, if I use an eigen, a modal expansion, slow evolution of the parameters can be coupled through perturbation. By the way, there's a couple of interesting limits of that one. There's one which is called the large determining limit. Delta is much bigger than 1. In other words, if the two eigenvalues, if their difference is very large, then essentially you get extremely high oscillations here. And this, on average, looks like 0. Same thing with here. So it's called the rotating wave approximation. So if this thing's oscillating very, very rapidly, it takes on its average value. And then you would get this here, which tells you that essentially there's no, really no mode coupling. So that's if you have a very large difference in the eigenvalues. Okay? However, there's another case, which is called the resonant forcing, which is if v of x takes this form here, times e to the i delta t. So the driving frequency of the forcing is exactly the difference between the eigenvalues. This is, we considered this case previously. This is like you being on a swing. You can have a resonance driving frequency. If there's two different eigenvalues separated by a certain amount, if you drive the system at exactly that uh, difference, 
you have a resonance forcing of the system. And in that case here, your resonance forcing gives you this equation here, which if as delta it goes to zero, this actually just tells you that, look, these are the governing equations, that the A of N couples to the A of M, and A of M couples to the A of N. This is an oscillator. Basically, these two modes are just exchanging energy at a characteristic frequency. This is exactly what happens in many systems if you drive it at resonance. They're just exchanging energy. So nothing's blowing up, nothing's growing. It just simply, if I drive the system, I, I, I'm moving energy back and forth between these two modes in a periodic fashion. Okay? That's what happens when you have resonance forcing of the system. You drive it from one state to the other and back to the other state, and it's periodic. And these are the governing equations for that description on some slow scale tau. You also can get coupling, mode coupling through the nonlinearity. Suppose that that forcing term is some nonlinear contribution. Then generically, when you apply solvability, dn d tau is just going to be equal to n of u naught inner product with v of n, but u naught here is going to be depends upon all the other mode fields. So you're going to generically get from here coupling from the a of nth mode to all the other modes in the system. Same thing with nth mode. And here, if it's just two modes, they're just going to couple to each other in some nonlinear fashion due to the fact that these inner products are no longer zero. That, in fact, there's no orthogonality in a, no, in a, in a nonlinear way. It's only linear orthogonality. Holds. So if you do this, you're just going to get mode coupling. So nonlinearity is going to drive mode coupling as well. So you can force the system or you can put in nonlinearity to create modal interactions in a system. And this is a perturbative way to calculate it. So remember, what we're assuming is that leading order, you have these mode fields that are essentially acting independently. And if I drive it or put nonlinearity in, they're going to now start to interact. And one way to understand this, and then the final way to think about how mode coupling can occur, is through non-orthogonality. Uh, for instance, you may add, what if the operator L is, in fact, not self-adjoint? If it's self-adjoint, the operator, leading operator L, self-adjoint, all the eigenfunctions are, in fact, orthogonal. However, if you have an operator that's not self-adjoint, you can actually get modes that are not orthogonal to each other. So when you do a, an expansion of this form, and remember, the way we get the evolution equations, we just simply say, take the inner product with respect to the different eigenfunctions, and you rely on orthogonality. But here, if they're not orthogonal, that means you're not going to get the inner products to be 0. So generically, all these co uh, evolution dynamics, A of n, are actually going to be coupled to each other because you don't have orthogonality enforced. So the, these are three distinct ways to get mode coupling in a dynamic system like this spatial temporal system. If you have, if you have a base structure where modal structures are uh, in your system, you can either get them to couple by driving the system through nonlinearity or from a system that has non-orthogonal modes. In all those cases, energy will be exchanged between these modes, resulting in different spatial temporal patterns. That's the important thing, right? This is going after pattern formation in these systems. And it all comes down to these descriptions on slow scales um, for differential equations, for the envelopes of, of how these things are evolving. OK, let me give you two examples to finish this up with. The first comes from quantum mechanics. So mode coupling in quantum mechanics is, is tremendously important. It tells us a lot about how we jump from one energy level to another. And oftentimes, we want to control that process. This is exactly we do, what we do in a laser, is if we can get an electron to jump up an energy state, and then when a photon comes to have it jump down, this is, we want to be able to be able to manipulate the atoms in that way as to jump them from energy state to energy state. So we do want mode coupling to happen. We want to control it. So here's the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics. And this has the following eigenfunction expansion solution. It's coefficient a of n, eigenfunctions phi of n, e to the i, e of n over h. So this here is our eigenvalue, and it's often called our energy levels in quantum mechanics where the eigenfunctions satisfy the following 
Schrodinger equation here. Okay, so this is so you take time out of this thing and you get basically a sturm lovell problem. And you look at the eigenfunctions of this; they're going to be orthogonal, or you're going to find an orthonormal base because it's 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 a it's a sturm lovell problem whose eigenvalues e to e of n are all real. So when we put them up here, you're going to get these rotations of the field. E of n is never imaginary because it's a sturm lovell problem. Okay. So that's the generic decomposition. And the question is, if, if I want to manipulate where atoms sit in my quantum well with all these eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, then I can do a few things to it. So for instance, I could drive my atomic system at some frequency omega with some just you know, perturbative forcing of the system. And then I would do exactly what we just talked about. All right. Do your expansion and let the amplitude depend upon time, or slow time, really, is what you want to let it do. And then you can find evolution equations for the slow time dynamics. So this is exactly what I've done here. I've just defined this parameter delta, which is the driving frequency of the perturbation. So remember, I'm driving this thing at some frequency omega, driving this atomic at some frequency omega. and I define this delta as being omega minus the difference of the two eigenvalue states, or the energy levels of the system. And I can rewrite u and v as some amplitude with this phase factor taken out. And then I get something like this, which is some differential equations for first order differential equations, which you can solve explicitly for the dynamics of the system. And here's the actual. The the actual solution to this. This is just a, it's a pretty, you know, it's a lot of algebra, but there it is. This is now your solution for understanding how when you drive this atomic system, how these, this electron keeps, is periodically jumping from one state to the other state if you drive it at that frequency omega t. What people often do in practice is they actually only drive it for a small amount of time so that if it's in the ground state, I make it pop up to the top state, the higher energy state, and then I turn off the forcing. And now, without a perturbation, it sits there. So now I put it up into the higher energy state, and I leave it there, for instance. That's one way to do a manipulation of this sort. So again, you can solve all this explicitly out and, and start getting the dynamics of how this transfer of energy from modes happens. And these modes, again, dictate the spatial patterns that you would see in practice. What about nonlinearity? Well, if nonlinearity were introduced into the system, here I've, I've done it with a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I've put in these nonlinear terms here as a perturbation. I've put an epsilon here as a perturbation. And I say, let's drive the system with a little bit of nonlinearity. Then you can do a perturbation expansion. And same kind of thing. You say, like, well, let's take our leading order solution and make there be slow time evolutions of the coefficients. And then applying solvability, you get slow time dynamics, which tells you how the nonlinearity is driving transitions. So you see, everything we're focused on here is the Fredholm alternative, introduction of sl slow scales, and doing our perturbation expansion. There's really nothing different from what we did at the beginning of the class until now, except for now we have both space and time. But really, the, the, the underlying methods are, are equivalent. Okay. One more example, and this comes from optical waveguides. And in practice, this is how to control light uh, in, in how to put them in waveguides and manipulate them, because we use this all the time in terms of uh, you know, light wave transmission systems. This is, this is the underlying principle is to put optical waveguides. Many of you have fiber to the home. Well, that's an optical waveguide. And you want to be able to manipulate that light any way you wish. Um, and one of the ways that people do this is by saying, here's the underlying governing equations. It's linear, some perturbation. And the perturbation we're going to consider here is what happens if we put what's called an index grading in this. So I may have my light in a certain modal field that I want to transition to another modal field. In that case, I can put this in a grading. And what the grading does is an index of refraction perturbation, which essentially generates some frequency response in time as it propagates through that. You can also put it through uh, uh, fibers that, in fact, have high intensity light, which create an index of refraction that's intensity independent. 
and that's what that's, this would look like. So there's two ways in optics to create this mode coupling. One is to put gratings on the system. The other is to increase the intensity of the light so that you get, in fact, an intensity dependent index of refraction, which also now has an effect on how light is being transmitted and how the modes are interplaying in the system. So if you were to just do your decomposition of the amplitude phase, separation of variables, here is your linear operator and your for to getting your eigenfunctions out of the system. So you have this operator here. Here's your index of refraction profile. And this is a sturm level problem. And depending upon your index of refraction profile, which is typically either parabolic or it's a, just a jump transition in the index, that's where the, the region where total internal reflection occurs, you get a certain set of modes. And lambda n's in these cases are called propagation constants associated with each, each of the different modes. And the question is, can I, can I use this information to couple energy between the different modes? And in fact, you can. So here, in fact, is an index of refraction profile. And here's what these modes might look like. Normally, there's what's called the ground state or the, the leading order mode, which is this one here. This is the index of refraction where it traps light completely in the cavity. But in this, I've picked the, the index of refraction to trap five modes. And here they are, the five different electric. And what this is is the electric field across the, 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 the optical waveguide. And you can see the dominant mode is here, or sorry, the ground state is here. And here are the four other modes of the system. So here's the task we want to do. If I just set this evolving into the system, it's going to look something like this. If I put all the energy in this ground state, it will just simply stay there. Nothing will happen. But I'm going to do uh, two experiments. Experiment number one. How would I take energy from this ground state here and move it into this blue state here, which is the third mode? Okay, So it's mode one, two, and three. Well, one way to do that is put it through a grating, where the grating would understand that the propagation constant for this mode is this, propagation constant for this is here. And if I just look at the difference between the two, what I'm going to do in this experiment here is I started it off first in the bottom state here. I now turn on a grating for a small amount of time where the grating period is exactly the difference between the first and the third modes, their, their propagation constants. And it transitions all the energy from that ground state up into this mode, and then I turn it off. And that's exactly what you see here. I turn on the grating, I switch the mode over into this new state, turn it off. So from a spatial temporal pattern point of view, which is what we've been looking at, this is an interesting way to transition from, you know, the, if you have dominant modal patterns, you can go from one pattern to another just by simply forcing the system at the right time scale to move it to the new state and then turn off that forcing. And that's exactly what I did here. Now, if I hadn't turned off the forcing, then it would simply go back and forth between this state to this state and back. Okay? But it gives you this possibility of manipulating these spatial temporal systems through their modal structures. This one here is I just included nonlinearity. And you can start to see, you can't see it so well on the light board, but if you look at the notes, you can see this a little better. But basically, this thing is starting to interact with these sets of modes through the nonlinearity itself. In other words, when you have a little bit of nonlinearity, if you look at the slow time evolution, it's starting to couple these modes together. Not just one to another, but really that ground state to all the different modes has a non-trivial representation. And here's just some of the dynamics that occurs over that time period. Again, it's oscillatory because, in fact, nothing's growing or decaying, but it's just starting to create this interaction where these modes are starting to exchange energy back and forth. So overall, I, what I, why I think this lecture is important to include in the overall aegis of pattern forming system is that many systems in practice, people often look at the modal structure as the dominant way to understand that system. The modal structures uh, you know, oftentimes are coming from these eigenfunction expansion ideas. And what this tells you is, if I want to understand how these modal structures interact, or how can I make them interact, 
this tells you that nonlinearity and driving the system can produce ways to characterize how these modal structures are interacting. In fact, what I showed you here was an uh, analytic way to get at a perturbation theory way to understand how the modal structures interact to produce potentially patterns in the system, either by driving it, driving a linear system so that the driving itself is what creates the interaction, or through nonlinearity. Nonlinearity itself can, can cause interactions among the modes, or systems where the underlying uh, expansion is not self-adjoint, so that you have non-orthogonal modes. Non-orthogonal modes also are automatically going to exchange energy, because any perturbation in the system is going to make uh, is going to make energy exchange, be exchanged between those modes. So it's another important way to do this. It still relies on perturbation theory. It still relies on Fredholm alternative. It's just that you're, you're exploiting underlying uh, eigenfunction expansion ideas in building up your model.